Safety comes tomorrow. The rightly guided ruler, Omar ibn Abdul Aziz, who was also considered to be an Islamic jurist, said in his last sermon, O people, indeed, you have not been created without a purpose, and you will not be left alone without being held accountable. And you have a final destination where Allah will judge among you. He will indeed be the loser who is outside of Allah's mercy, which comprehends all things. He is the loser who will be forbidden from paradise, whose width is as the heavens and the earth. Know that safety tomorrow is for he who fears his Lord and sells a small amount to achieve abundance. For he who sells that which is perishing for that which shall remain, I say this to you, though I do not know of anyone among you who has more sins than me, and I ask Allah to forgive both me and you. Such was the humility of good doers who were practicing Muslims, and indeed Allah's mercy is near the good doers. Wise Sayings from Fudail and Ibn Mubarak Fudail ibn Iyab said, If you are not able to fast or pray, then know that you are shackled and confined by your sins. Allah the Exalted says, Yes, whosoever earns evil and his sin has surrounded him, they are dwellers of the fire. They will dwell therein forever. Ibn Mubarak said, I saw that sins cause hearts to die, that base actions lead to their addiction, that avoiding sins is life for the heart, and that it is better for your soul for you to disobey it. The Bedouin and Ibn Uyayna It has been related that a Bedouin spent a long time in the company of Sufyan Ibn Uyayna listening to the ahadith that he related. When the Bedouin decided to return to his home country, Sufyan asked, O Bedouin, what did you like most from my ahadith? He said, Three ahadith only. First, the hadith of Aisha, radiyallahu anha, from the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that he liked sweets and honey. The second is the hadith wherein he said, that if dinner is served and the prayer has commenced, then begin with dinner. And the third is the hadith of Aisha, radiyallahu anha, that it is not from righteousness to fast while one is on a journey. I came seeking help, not a religious ruling. One day, a man accosted Omar ibn Hubayra, on the road and said, O ruler of the Arabs, I want to perform Hajj. He said, The path lies before you, and may Allah make it easy for you. The man said, I am unable to walk. Omar said, Ride for a day and walk for a day. He said, I do not own anything with which I may purchase or rent a mount. He said, Then Hajj is not obligatory upon you. The man said, O ruler of the Arabs, I came to you seeking help, not a religious ruling. Omar laughed and gave him 5,000 dirhams. He is insane. A man went to Ibn Aqil and said, Whenever I plunge myself two or three times into a river to take a bath, I am not sure whether the water reached every part of my body, and am consequently unsure whether I have purified myself. What should I do? He said, Do not pray. Why do you say that? Ibn Aqil answered. Allah's Messenger wasallam, said, The pin is raised from three, from the child until he reaches adulthood, from the one who is sleeping until he wakes up, and from the insane man until he regains his senses. And whoever plunges himself 
into a river once, twice, and then three times, yet still feels he has not taken a shower, is insane. He chose the hereafter. Maslama ibn Abdul Malik visited Omar ibn Abdul Aziz while he was on his deathbed and said, O leader of the believers, you have always prevented your children from this wealth, and you have left them poor, though they need something for their upkeep. If you delegate me to provide for them, I will give them what they need. Omar said, Sit down, help me sit up, and then call to me my children. He called them, and in total, there were twelve boys. Omar looked from one to the other until his eyes became filled with tears. He then said, O oh, my children, I have left you in a good situation, and you will never pass by a Muslim or one who has a covenant with us except that you have an obligatory right over him. O oh, my children, I was left with two options. Between you remaining poor in this world and between your father entering the hellfire. For you to remain poor in this world until the end of time is better than for your father to spend a single day in the hellfire. Stand, children. May Allah protect you and provide for you. Maslama said, After their father's death, Omar's children were never poor or in need. Malik ibn Dinar He once said to some of his students, When you perceive hardness in your heart, weakness in your body, and paucity in your sustenance, then know that you have spoken about that which does not concern you. True Honor Allah the Exalted said in the Noble Qur'an, that honor comes only through piety. Verily, the most honorable of you with Allah is that believer who has taqwa, meaning piety. It is related that Omar ibn al-Khattab, radiyallahu anhu, passed by a man who proudly said, I am from the valleys of Mecca. He stood over him and said, if you have a religion, then you have honor. If you have a sound mind, then you have dignity. If you have knowledge, then you have respect. Otherwise, you are on an equal footing with donkeys. And it has been said, honor during the days of ignorance was achieved by eloquent speech, by bravery, and by forbearance, and in Islam, by religion and piety. A Thief and a Message Ibn Zuhair al-Anbari sent a messenger to his family with 30 sheep and a sack full of cooking fat. The messenger stole one sheep and skimmed some cooking fat from the top of the sack. When he reached the family, he said, Do you have a message for him that I may convey? The wife said, Inform him that the month is waning and the fence that used to overlook us is broken. When the messenger returned to Zuhair, he gave him the message, and Zuhair, understanding his wife's secret message, knew what happened. He forced a confession out of the thief and made him return the sheep and the cooking fat. The wicked doer has sufficed us all with his evil. Bakr ibn Abdullah al-Muzani related the following story. There was a man who was known for spending a lot of time in the courts of kings. He would stand beside a certain king and say, Do good to the good doer with his goodness, for the evil doer will suffice you with his evil. Another man was jealous of him for his status and for his speech. So he decided to come between him and the king. He went to the king and said, 
The man who stands beside you and says such and such claims that you have bad breath. The king said, And how do I know this is true? He said, Call him to you, and if he draws near you and places his hand on his nose so as not to smell your bad breath, then you will know that I have spoken the truth. The king said, Go, and I will see. He left the king and went to invite the other man to his house for dinner. During dinner, he fed him food that was heavy with garlic. The guest left and went to the king, as was his custom, and said, Do good to the good doer with his goodness, for indeed the evil doer will suffice you with his evil. The king said, Come near me. He went near the king and placed his hand on his mouth fearing that the king would smell the foul odor of the garlic. The king said to himself, I do now realize that the other man had spoken the truth. The king then wrote a letter to a governor, instructing him as follows. When the one who is carrying this letter comes to you from me, slaughter him and cut him up into pieces. He gave the man the letter, and as the man was on his way to meet the governor, the other man, who had plotted to destroy him, met him on the way and said, What is this letter? He said, A letter from the king for an endowment to be given to me. The other man said, Give it to me as a gift. He said, All right, I give it to you as a gift. The man took the letter and went with it to the governor. The governor said, it says in this letter that I have to slaughter you and cut you into pieces. The man said, This letter does not belong to me. You must return to the king and clear up the matter. The governor said, When the king sends a letter, one does not return to him to discuss his commands. And so he slaughtered him and cut him up into pieces. The other man returned to the king, as was his custom, and said the same phrase that he always said to him. The king was amazed and said, What did you do with the letter? He said, Such and such person came to me, asked for the letter, and I gave it to him as a gift. The king said, Indeed, he told me that you claim that I have bad breath. He said, I never said that. The king said, Then why did you put your hand on your mouth? He said, because that man had fed me garlic, and I disliked for you to smell it. The king said, You have spoken the truth. Return to your position beside me, for indeed the wicked doer has sufficed us all with his evil. Charity and Sickness In 1408, the newspaper Al Muslimun, issue number 181, dated Dhul Hijjah, the 8th, 1408, related the following story. It is a real-life story whose hero is a Syrian doctor who was afflicted with cancer and who remedied it with charity. Dr. Isa al-Marzuki related that he was afflicted with cancer, a fact that is attested by the most eminent of doctors in Damascus. The amazing thing is that he was cured through charity. After many of his colleagues lost hope of his cure, the said doctor returned to the hospital to assume his duties. The doctor's fiancé had refused to break off their marriage because of the sickness, and instead decided to wait patiently until he died. But instead of that happening, he was saved. He later provided authenticated certificates from many eminent doctors, that he had cancer in his left armpit. They also attested to the fact that later on, no traces of that cancer remained. In fact, the first doctor who diagnosed him said that at first, he expected him to die only after a few days. Dr. Isa Marzuki later said that he applied the words of Allah's Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Remedy your sick ones with charity. With that statement, 
he still had hope. And so, when he found out about a house whose breadwinner had died many years before, he decided to give them all the wealth he had, even though it was only a small amount. He sent the money to the poor family through a friend of his, asking him to tell them that the money was from a man afflicted with a death-threatening sickness and that he was seeking a cure by giving charity, hoping for help from Allah. The story ended with his cure, which perplexed many of the most skilled doctors in Syria. He later said that he chose that cure because he wanted to follow the way of Allah's Messenger ﷺ. He also said, however, that he did not leave off treatment through normal medical methods. He believed in the divine preordainment, but that belief does not mean that one should turn away from doctors, nor does it mean that one should not take the appropriate, tangible steps that are needed to achieve a desired goal. The Ruler and His Brother A man stood before Al-Wathiq Billah and said, O leader of the believers, join ties with and have mercy upon your relatives and be generous to a man from your family. Al-Wathiq Billah said, And who are you? For I never saw you before this day. He said, I am the son of your grandfather Adam. He said, O oh, young man, give to him one dirham. The man said, O oh, leader of the believers, and what should I do with this? He said, Suppose that I were to divide the treasury among your brothers from the children of my grandfather. Would your share be equal to even a single grain? The man then praised him for his intelligence, after which he was given a 